welcome to our Resurrection Sunday celebration. Me and the Easter Bunny are just here to welcome you guys this morning and just, you know, sit back, enjoy the praise and worship, enjoy the preaching, and we're just so happy to have you guys here. So follow us on in so we can get started for the service. Follow me, Easter Bunny. for joining us today. Resurrection Sunday is the most exciting Sunday. As you can see, we are so thankful to God and Jesus, what he did for us to save our souls. If you are a new convert, we're praying that God has just blessed you and we are available to you in any aspect to help promote Jesus further in your life. Do not hesitate to get a hold of us on Facebook, our website, and we will get back with you. This week, as usual, third, uh, Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. is our prayer time. If you have a prayer request, please send that in. Uh, just put it on our Facebook and we will get that announced. Also, Wednesday night, Zoom at 6.30 is our AMPT Youth Department. Eight o'clock is next adult, young adult group. 7 o'clock Thursday night is our adult Bible study, and there's always so much more. So just keep in tune. We have a lot of announcements coming out this week. God bless you, and remember, Jesus is alive.
Again, thank you for being here. I hope so far it's already been a blessing to you. Take this moment and share and just continue to worship with us throughout the rest of the service. Thank you guys.
Jesus, we love you, Lord. How great thou art. How great thou art. Father, that you would sacrifice for such as I. Oh, Lord, we love you. We love you, Lord. No greater sacrifice could be made. Jesus, we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday with our hearts humble before you. Nothing can stop this movement that you have started. Thank you, Father. Holy Adiyasi. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In your glorious name, Jesus, we pray. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to our Easter Sunday morning service. We are so happy to have you here worshiping with us on this great day. Uh, I want to say thank you for tuning in, being a part. We've been praying for you, and I know you've been praying for us to be safe. And we're praying the blessing of God upon this church in the state of Oklahoma, and this great nation, that this virus will pass and uh, we'll celebrate when it's all over. I was thinking this morning as I was getting ready, I was credentialed in 1967 and preached a lot of Easter services. This is the first one I preached to almost an empty building, but with a camera rolling. So thank you for being a part. And uh, we're going to pray that God blesses. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that as we read these scriptures and share the word, that you'd reach out beyond this building into the hearts and lives of the people that are watching and that you would all give us hope and help and faith. I pray it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. I'm going to read from Matthew 28, 1 through 7, and it reads like this. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and, her other, and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. I, I think it's interesting to me that the dawn of the first day of the week it was as the sun was coming up on a Sunday morning. I've said this before, but I wanted to say it again. The reason why we have church on Sunday morning is that we celebrate every week the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I know and I understand you could have church any day of the week. You can find his presence. You can have a study any day of the week. But Sunday is a very special day because that's the day, the first day of the week, that's the day that Jesus came out of the tomb alive and well. The two Marys went down to the tomb looking to see what was going on there. It's not an uncommon practice even today that after a burial, people go back to the spot to reminisce and think about all the things that that person meant in their life. 
I've done it, and I know that you that are watching have done the same thing with a friend, a, a relative, maybe a close mom and dad that had passed. You go to that gravesite, you maybe read that name, you look, you start talking about all the good things he or she had done, had said, what they'd meant, their blessing they'd been to you. And I think the two Marys, when they were going to the tomb, didn't go looking for the resurrection. I think they went looking to reestablish memories that they had had of being with Jesus. There's just something about being in his presence. It's a captivating thing. In our church right here, there's been times when the presence and power of God has come down so strong in this building that it captivates us and we come back again and again because we have a desire to have or to be in that place where he is, to be next to him. It's amazing to me the glory of God and how it's almost like a drug at times drawing us back time and time again. The two Marys were coming back to the tomb, not anticipating the resurrection, but they were anticipating, thinking about what Jesus had done. They had saw miracles. They had been a part of his life and they wanted to reminisce. Now, an angel had got there before they got there. And the ground shook. They'd had an earthquake. It, I've thought about this many times. And living in California, I've been through quite a few earthquakes. I've seen the ground shake. I've seen the ground roll like water, a wave on water. And it's a very unsettling thing. But the ground shook and the stone was rolled away. And the angel was sitting on top of the stone. And the scripture says that his countenance was like lightning. It was captivating. When you saw it, you can't take your eyes off of him. His clothes were white as snow. And the Roman guards who had been trained to kill and fight, when they saw the presence of this angel, it says they shook and they fell even like they were dead as Jesus came out of that tomb. I thought about those Roman soldiers, how that they had been in combat. They had fought many a battle and they were under orders. And this is the way the Roman government did it. That if you failed, you could die. A lot of times today we court martial someone and they'll lose a strike. But in Rome, in a Roman soldier, they didn't lose a strike. They would lose their life. This tomb was sealed. They wanted to make sure that nobody, nobody could steal the body of Jesus. Nobody dreamed, nobody thought that he could actually come alive, be resurrected back to life. They thought maybe one of the disciples would come or and steal him in some way. And so they put the soldiers there to guard this place, this tomb. They was going to make sure nothing else was said, that they could put Jesus to, to bed in this controversy that was going on in Israel. But they fell out whenever the power of God moved in their life. I thought... I thought it was strange that when they got there, with eyes big and hair standing on the end and goosebumps on their arms as they looked at this site, the tomb was open, this angel sitting on top of the stone, and all of a sudden he began to talk. I know why you're here. You've come to see the Christ, Jesus. You know, he was insinuating or saying, you come to see a dead man laying in a tomb. You see, a lot of times we come to church and we're here because maybe we think it's just the right thing to do. 
We don't really feel very spiritual that Sunday morning. And maybe right now you're out there and you, you're just sick and tired of the virus and you're sick and tired of being locked up at home and you're sick and tired of maybe not working and you're sick and tired of all the things that's seemingly going wrong and you're not really looking for a blessing. The two women, the two women, they, they didn't go to the tomb looking for a blessing and to see the resurrection. They went there looking to revitalize a memory and a thought that they had had about all the good things that Jesus had done. And all of a sudden, they have seen something that just absolutely blew them away. The tomb was open and Jesus was alive. When the angel looked at him and said, I know why you're here, you've come to see Jesus, but he's resurrected and he's one ahead of you and he's in town. He's gone to town and that's where he'll be. And you can tell the disciples to meet him there. And I thought, you know, what was it that brought Jesus to that cross? What was it that made the cross a thing that he could not escape? <clears throat> Surely there would have been another way or wouldn't, wasn't as bad as dying on a cross, but the cross represents something. You see, there was sin in the world and sin needed a savior. No matter how good you try to be, you can't be good enough to save yourself. No matter how much you've tried to do the right thing, doing the right thing is not the thing that will get you into heaven. It's knowing Christ in a personal way, allowing him to be your savior. It's not a church building. It's not a church creed or a church doctrine that saves you. It's a personal experience with Christ. He can change your life and he has the power to change your life because he defeated death, hell, and the grave. On this Sunday morning, he changed the world forever. You don't have to live in sin. You don't have to live with the burden of sin in your life. You can live in the, in the realms of forgiveness and the joy of having eternal life. God's a good God. You see, if you're a parent and you as a mom and dad take your two or three kids to a store, you walk in that store and a lot of these stores will have, if you break it, you buy it. And they do that because a lot of times kids will pick stuff up and break it. And how many times have you said to little Johnny or Susie, don't touch anything. Don't touch nothing in the store. But even at that, kids will see things and want to bring it to you. And how many times have you brought, bought a broken vase or a broken a plaque or a broken plate. If it's broke, you had to buy it. You had to pay a price. Well, it's true in this situation. You see, Adam and Eve sinned. They broke God's law. And so man needed a savior. But now men always try to save themselves. That's just the way it is. It's just part of our human nature. If it just seems too easy to just pray the sinner's prayer. Forgive me of my sins. Write my name in the book of life. And, you know, he said, if you'd confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. It's too easy sometimes in men's hearts to believe that. I remember when I was in the service and I had three days liberty in Manila, I've told this story before, but I had found a taxi cab driver and I said, I want to see every site that you can see in Manila. I want to take a picture of it. I want to see it. I want to eat in the best restaurant you've got. And I don't remember just how much the price was, but he said, I'll do it. And I got in his cab 
And he said, I'm going to take you to a place where I think you'd like to see first. And we went to the town square. And when we got down there, there was a man, several men there, but there was one man in the process of crucifying himself. I stood there along with about 75 or 80 other people and he took a nail and he drove it through his foot into a board and he drove a nail into the other foot through the board and there was a guy helping him and they was tying his legs on and he held a nail in his hand and he took this big old mallet and he drove that nail through his hand and they tied his hand on the cross and another man drove the nail in his other hand and tied him to this cross. They lifted that cross up and here he is and he's crying and bleeding and praying. And I said, what did this man do? What is this all about? And he said, he's, it's part of his, it's part of Lent. He's, he's punishing himself for sin. And, and he named off several other things that this man was battling and some issues that he was battling. And I said, we stood there for probably 15 minutes and I watched this man just bleeding out as he was on this cross. And I had seen a lot of things at that time. I had seen a lot of things in my life at that time, but I had never seen a man crucify himself on a cross trying to purge himself or save himself from his sins. But God spoke to me in my heart and he said, you cannot save yourself no matter what you do. The perfect sacrifice was Jesus. You see, this man was born after the similitude of Adam. He had sin in his life. We're just sinners by nature. But when Jesus came to planet earth and he died upon that cross, he had no sin in his life. He was not born after Adam's seed. He had no sin. He was perfect, a perfect sacrifice. When Jesus hung between heaven and earth, I'm telling you right now, he had everything in his life right where he could dot, dot out or wash out sin. There's no sin you've committed. There's no problem you're facing that he can't solve for you. There's no sin too big that he can't forgive you of that sin. You haven't went too far. I've had a lot of people tell me I've sinned too long and I've sinned too far. I've done too many horrible things. God cannot forgive me. I don't know where you're coming from or how you come up with that, but I want to tell you, you cannot get to the place where God cannot come and reach down and save you from that spot where you're at. Just as sure as a mom and dad would pay for that plate that you broke as a kid to get you out of that restaurant or out of that place, Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins. Let me share another thought with you. That um, it's what's the cross all about? What, what, why the cross? What was it? What was the meaning of that? And it really speaks about the love of God for mankind. You hear it a lot. If you're the pastor of a church, you hear it a lot. If God really loved people. How come? There's people starving to death and even the virus that's going on. You know, I've had people say, well, if God's really a God of love, why is he letting people die with this virus like it is? And, you know, there are people dying. But you're not dying, you're alive right now. You're hearing me, you're listening to, to what I'm saying. And I can't tell you or explain to you why any person on earth, why they died, why they had to go the way they went. But I can say this, that wherever you're at, 
That cross doesn't represent God's punishment. It represents God's way of saving you from being punished. He let Jesus die on that cross. Oh my, a lot of men died on the cross. You know, if you've studied history, the Appian Way, the main road leading into Rome, had st places for about 6,000 crosses. Most of the time, those places where the crosses were had somebody hanging on that cross, dying. When you walked in, it would be a terrifying sight to see if you'd never seen it before because people would be begging someone that walked by to help them get me off of this cross. But they died, people were dying. And I'm just simply making a statement that when God let Jesus die, he was showing his love for mankind. Now we're all gonna pass one day but what a glorious thing it's going to be to have Jesus on our side. A Sunday school teacher was teaching about the cross and the power of the cross and the value of the cross and why Jesus had to die on the cross. And she asked her little class, is there anybody have any thoughts or anything you'd like to say? Now, sometimes this can be dangerous when you're asking little kids to add to the class because you don't know what they're going to say. But one little boy in the class said, he said, it's kind of like this. He said, it's kind of like a firefighter. He said, a building's on fire. And he said, there's somebody in the building and the firefighter runs in to save the person, but he loses his life trying to save someone else. And you know, that's really kind of what it's about. Jesus died on that cross that you and I might have eternal life. I can't imagine the pain that Jesus went through. They flogged him till when he walked up the Via Della Rosa going to the station of the cross, the Golgotha, his footprints were in blood. History says that the flesh was tore off and the muscle was ripped off that you could actually see his lungs work as he was moving up that cross, up that way to the way of the cross. What a horrible sight. They made fun of him. While they were trying him, they slapped him. They placed a crown of thorns on him. They put a robe on him. And said, you are the king of the Jews. And they did all the things they could do to torment him, to make his life as miserable as they possibly could before they killed him. He even carried his own cross up to Golgotha. But before he got to the top, Simon the Serene picked the cross up and carried it the rest of the way. All of that time, Jesus was just paying the price for sin so that you and I could stand here today. And even though we're still human beings, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, that if you believe it's accounted for righteousness unto him. I'm just simply making a statement on this great Easter day. When the two women went down to the tomb, they went down to look, to reminisce about the life of Christ, but they become a firsthand, they had a firsthand experience with the supernatural. And they saw an angel and they seen where he was. He was resurrected. I'm just saying to you, you can have that same experience. God wants to touch your life. He wants to touch you right now with his presence and power. 
You might be saying, preacher, I'm living too far away. You're not too far away that he can't reach down and touch you and get you and pull you back in. Maybe you're not living as close to God as you need to live to, uh, with him. You've been too careless maybe with your life and your experiences. I'm just making a statement now that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to recommit your life to God while the power of the Holy Spirit is moving. The same power that put those Roman soldiers on the ground, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and well and is ready to touch you and make you alive spiritually under the things of God. Would you bow your head with me while we pray and seek God? Lord, if there's anyone out there that needs to know you in a personal way, I pray right now on this Easter Sunday morning that you would just put new life. Lord, as they pray the sinner's prayer, Lord, forgive me of all of my sins. Write my name in the book of life. I'll confess you before men. I pray, Lord, right now that you would put spiritual life into that person. Touch them. And Lord, I believe there's some that's just living too far away from you. Draw them up close. Help them see the price you paid for salvation. What you gave. I pray, Lord, you'd help them to give a little more. Bring them back into that place where they need to be in you. Lord, if there's something sick, Lord, you took those stripes that we might have healing. I pray for healing. Heal those, Lord, that are reaching out to you. I pray that you put your blessing on those. Touch us all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey, thank you for being with us today. Easter Sunday, we are so proud of this wonderful opportunity to come together. Don't forget about our schedules that we have all week long. Check us on familyoffaithok.com and get that information. God bless you. We love you. Happy Easter.